Hello, I'm Karen Simon, Chair of the Department of Music at the University of Prince Edward Island. Welcome to this edition of our Distinguished UPEI Music Alumni Series. Throughout this series of podcasts, we invite our music alumni to share their music and professional journeys. In so doing, we look to our students' past as a means of informing and perhaps inspiring our current students. Today's guest is trumpeter, music educator, and conductor, class of 1998 alumnus, Jonathan Baird. This podcast is being recorded in February 2022. I am in Charlottetown, where it's about minus 10 degrees, and Jonathan is participating from his home in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur, where it's nighttime and it's in the mid 30s. There's a 12 hour time difference between our locations. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks for having me, Dr. Simon. That's an honor. Good, good, good. So uh, let's get started. Jonathan, could you describe your childhood and music related experiences? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Murray River, Prince Edward Island, town of 300 people. A lot of good people and, come from Murray River. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I went to Montague High School. I, my, my parents, neither of them were musical. Um, my dad really liked uh, classical music and we would have that playing in the background at home, but neither of them played instruments or sang or anything like that. Um, I think I was in some fiddle lessons when I was five years old, but, you know, maybe for a year or so. Um, but go going up through elementary school, Montague Consolidated, I loved singing in the choir. And then when the opportunity came along to join the band program, uh, Robert Cromer, um, he, he did something in whenever we were in grade six, and he took like a, a handful of uh, kids from grade six when we were still in el elementary school and started us on band instruments. And then uh, we, uh, I went to junior high school in grade seven, and there was two classes, the class that started in grade seven, and then us who started in grade six. Hmm. And uh, I, I remember at that time, actually, in grade seven, like I felt like I could make a sound well on the trumpet and whatnot, and I liked playing, but I was really struggling with reading. That, that was tough for me. And I remember going to Mr. Cromer at the time and saying, listen, like I'm really having a tough time with reading. I kind of think I should join the class that just started this year. And then he, he, he actually tried to convince me to stick with it, to stay with that kind of more advanced group. And I was like, no, like this is just not, not happening. And, uh, and then so I, I did that move. And then basically within a few months, like I was just reviewing stuff, the basics again, and something just clicked and it worked. And then basically by grade eight, I was practicing all the time. And by grade nine, I was still in the junior high, but I was then playing with the high school band. Um, and yeah, it just, it just clicked and I, I took off with it. And I, I wasn't studying with anybody, but I just, I liked playing. So I would come home and, you know, there's not much else to do at Murray River. So I'd practice my trumpet, go to work at my dad's store and then play the trumpet. Yeah, and then I started, um, actually started taking some lessons from Mark Parsons. I think if I'm not mistaken, when I was in grade 12. So I Dan St. Amand actually came to Montague and was uh, my band teacher in grade 11, just for one year. And then Christy Beck uh, took the job the following year, but he was a, a big influence on me as well as a trumpet player. And then Mark Parsons helped me get ready for my audition at UPEI and yeah. There you go. Dan St. Yeah. Amand, Christy Beck, Mark Parsons. Those are really uh, fine names here in Prince. Oh, yeah. Good. So why'd you choose UPEI? Well, um, I think Mark was a big influence on that. Um, so for me, coming from a small town, uh, I, I think I was a little bit sheltered. I kind of didn't know what was out there in the world. Um, I knew I loved to play the trumpet, and, and that mattered to me that I was going to be in a place where I could play and I was going to get good instruction. 
And so I, I did an audition at Acadia and also one at Mount A and then UPI, of course. And then just talking with Mark, um, Greg Irvin was the brass teacher there at the time. And when I was looking at the, the possibilities of who I could study with, that, that definitely stood out. And so that's why I came to UPEI. Good, very good. So can you describe your focus while you were a student here? And, and, and what about the UPEI music experience resonated with you? Sure. Well, I think, that, I think one of the greatest assets of UPEI is the fact that it's small. We're in a small place, a small community, and it's, it's, a, it's a small pond. And that means that because there's not that many people around, there's lots of places to play. And there's lots of places to develop your musicianships, with, which doesn't always exist in um, major cities where the competi competition is, is that much more. So uh, UPI was fantastic. You, for the, for the uh, music department to survive, everybody has to be part of the choir. Everybody has to be part of the band. Like you, you have to be part of it. And it's, it's just understood by everybody that you are developing your musicianship, that that is important. Uh, and what I later discovered after meeting people from different places in the world is that's not always the case for music education students. Um, so I, I just think that's the opportunities from that were just excellent and uh, yeah, real, a real foundation for me. Good, yeah. very good. So some of the highlights of your studies at UPEI. Could you focus on that? Sure. A little? Yeah, well, uh, actually, with, with you, Dr. Simon, I remember you took over the Wind Symphony when I was in my third year. Um, Greg Irvin went on sabbatical, and Dave Coots came in and was the uh, brass teacher for that year. But you invited me uh, to play the La Virgin de la Macarena as a soloist. And that was my first time ever as a soloist with a big group. Um, I remember you told me as well, you're like, okay, if you're, if you're doing this, uh, it has to be memorized. There you and go. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. And that was important. Yeah. Um, and Jonathan, I, I yeah. remember very distinctly your performances of that work. And, 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 and this was new ground actually for UPI in terms of having a soloist with the wind. Sure. And, and I recall you just, just killing it with multiple performances because I think we performed in Picto, we performed in Truro, in, in Cape addition, Breton as well. Yeah, and in addition to uh, our performance uh, at the Dr. Steele Recital Hall at UPEI. Good. Yeah, and I remember that too because one of the things that doesn't always happen as a soloist is Oftentimes, if you're a soloist, then you come out and you play your solo and thank you very much, you're done for the night. Yeah. But I, I remember I still had to play like right. the lead jumper parts with everything else as yeah. well. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah the demands oh, yeah. on you at that time were really very high. And, and I yeah. remember, actually, I, I think scheduling uh, uh, your solo piece relatively early in the program yeah. uh, so that your chops would be as fresh as possible. Um, totally, it had to be done. Oh, for sure. Good. Let's yeah. move on. Other other highlights of your undergraduate studies. Yeah. Well, I, I guess um, the music festivals were great. Um, I, you know, I, I was able to go to the nationals twice. Um, yeah, I won the Susan Suzanne Brent. Brennan Award. That's right. Yeah, right. Played with the um, the PEI Symphony. That was pretty amazing. But I guess, like you know, again, highlights for me from UPEI days is is also the professors and what we were taught there. Um, I don't know if things are are different now, but like we had to take every single type of music class that exists. Yeah. <laughs> and again, that doesn't exist in most other universities. Um, but yeah, we took all of the music ed classes. The, uh, you, you had four years of your, uh, on your applied instrument, you did recitals. Um, all of those things were, 
you had to do it all. Um, and yeah, that background that I had moving on afterwards was just so strong compared to, again, people coming from much bigger universities where, where they kind of focused in a lot earlier. They were either a performance person and that's all they did, or they were an ed person and they forgot about their instrument after a year or two. Um, yeah, so like, I think, yeah, my wife and I, um, who I met at UPEI, that was also very important. Um, <laughs> um, both of us are just so appreciative of the foundation that we got at UPEI. Good, good. Mm. And, and some of your, your classmates during your years at, at UPEI. Oh yeah, we had fantastic people and we lived in the music department. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I was in the residence my first year and I remember like I would wake up in the morning and go eat at the cafeteria. And then I was in the music department until midnight every day. Um, you, you just live there, we practice there. I, I did a math minor as well. So went out for my math classes and right back to the music department. Um, but yeah, we had, who do we have then? Um, so Nicole Bellamy, um, Nicole Ross. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we started together and Claire Kaisley, Claire Smith now. Um, yeah, Mike Ross uh, was with us as well. Yes, uh, uh, Carrie Ann Matheson was there, Kevin McLean, like just these amazing musicians. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good pair group, Jonathan. Oh, yeah. Very good. Okay, so um, after you finished your degree, um, you did some teaching, you did some subbing and mm -hmm. some work at Colonel Gray. Could you speak to that? Sure. Well, like I, I'd like to preface it by saying when I was in high school, I, 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 I can go back now and look at my yearbook and it says on there that I wanted to be a music teacher. Hmm. I knew in high school that I wanted to be a music teacher. I loved teaching. And I remember uh, going in and uh, uh, I had a free period in my grade 12 year and Christy Beck um, was teaching a middle school class at the time. And she's She'd give me all the brass players and I would take them. And I, I just loved working with kids. Uh, it was fantastic. And then even when I went to UPI, I'd go back to Montague and I would uh, teach the jazz band after school um, one day a week. Um, but I always, I loved to play as well. Um, so for me, those two things were, were really equal. And I, I, I kind of struggled with that a little bit. Um, you know, which, which way do I go? So... Anyway, yeah, after I finished UPEI, um, yeah, my wife had two years left. Jamin had two years left to finish. And so um, I, I was pretty certain that I wanted to go do my master's um, at McGill in performance and kind of focus there, but I also love teaching. So I subbed for a year um, just with every subject you can imagine. And um, and then I taught a, a grade 11 band class at Colonel Gray um, in 1999. Oh. Yeah. And yeah, that, that was great. They had like a huge band program at the time. And that's, that's why they invited me there. There was just, there was too many students uh, in the program, but it was fantastic. Great sounding band. Uh, I learned a ton. Yeah. I, I think we went to, the nationals that year and and won gold as well it was fantastic yeah there you go uh, i i remember that rather distinctly because um uh, my son joshua was in your grade that's oh, right i forgot about that class. and he very much was uh enjoying your influence at the school good so mm. a, a couple of years teaching locally here in charlottetown and then you go to grad school so could you talk about McGill University and sure. those at that school that that had uh, that shaped you. Sure. Well, so uh, going to McGill, um, I guess to get ready for that, uh, even when I was at UPEI, I I knew I needed to do something with performance. I I, I loved it, um, and. To get ready for that, I guess, one of the things that I was never shy about was just calling somebody up and asking for a lesson. So um, Charlottetown Festival has amazing musicians that come and play in the pit orchestra. So 
Um, Jim Gardner used to be a member there and Jeff Thompson, that's like Toronto Symphony Orchestra and the Quebec Symphony Orchestra. And um, th when they were in town, I would go get lessons. And then Jennifer Snow also came to teach at UPEI in, in uh, my third year. And at that point in time, her fiance was Jens Lindemann from the Canadian Brass. And so he used to come a number of times through the year to visit her. And every time she came, I was like, Jens, I need to take a lesson. And I would do that. And I would drive to Toronto and take lessons from uh, Andrew McCandless and the Toronto Symphony and Paul Markello in the um, Montreal Symphony. Um, and this was all before I went to grad school. Um, so especially that year um, prior to going to grad school, I, I used to drive up to Montreal, which is like an 11 hour drive. Um, and I would call Paul Markello up and say, okay, can I, can I come take a lesson? And he would schedule and I would drive up there and take a lesson, usually continue on to Toronto and take one with somebody else. But I, I did that a lot that year. Yeah. Um, and so I was preparing for, for my audition and preparing with Paul Markello, who I wanted to study with. So I went and did my audition. And then after the audition, he wasn't even on the panel. Um, he, he uh, yeah, I went and took a lesson with him after my, my audition. And uh, he's like, I'm, I just want to tell you right now, I know the school hasn't said anything, but I'm going to take you as one of my students next year. He's like, I only ever take two people per year. But, you know, like, obviously you play, you're, you're playing really well, but, you know, I can see what kind of like drive and, and whatnot that you, you, you're, you're showing with your own uh, musicianship and what you're willing to do. So like, he's like, that's, that's the kind of student that I need. He's like, I'm super busy. I'm playing as a soloist all around the world and Montreal Symphony is super busy. So I, I'm not gonna be there to, I, I can't like hold somebody's hand. Um, I need somebody who's gonna, be working and uh, anyway, so yeah, that that kind of network connection and you know just not being shy about calling somebody up and making connections. I think that really helped me um, get to McGill. Yeah, um, yeah. And so then when I was at McGill, obviously, then I I was studying with Paul Markello, who was ridiculously good and. I almost think I learned more just by sitting beside him, listening to him play whatever it was on my music stand, um, even more so than the words he said, like it, words were fantastic, but yeah, just sitting beside him like week after week was incredible. Plus, obviously then I was also um, working with Russ Devist, who was the associate principal trumpet player at the, at the same time. Um, plus just all of the other great brass musicians in Montreal. Good. Yeah, so that was fantastic. Yeah, and so then at, at McGill, it was exactly what I needed at the time. The, it was a performance degree in orchestral music and my whole degree was mostly just playing. It's like, a, for, for me, it was like playing in the orchestra, um, taking my lessons, doing recitals, most of that, was my coursework. I think I only took three classroom classes while I was there. Wow. The rest was just all playing. Um, and it just really developed my musicianship um, and helped me make connections as well. So that was, that was fantastic. I loved my time there. Good. So can you outline your career, Jonathan, as a trumpet player? Sure. So yeah, as a, as a trumpet player, um, so I, I believe the, obviously like when I was at McGill, um, I started playing around town in Montreal a little bit. And then, you know, kind of year after year it would pick up. But I think in my second year at McGill, I started playing with the Montreal Symphony when they needed extra players, which was crazy. I, could, I still remember getting that first phone call, played a, a, the Verdi Requiem with Charles Dutois. Yeah, it was, it was nuts. Um, yeah, and yeah, then it was just like a lot of freelance work. And then I also, well, I, so I was married at the time as well. I had a child. Um, so 
you know, I had to bring home money as well. So uh, yeah, I, I worked a lot. Like I worked as much as I could as a musician, as a trumpet player, and also taught a lot of private students. Um, but I, I had a math minor from UPEI as well. So I, uh, I tutored a ton of math as well. And I was in the military. Uh, and yeah, so I was part of a, the 438 um, helicopter squadron just outside of Montreal. And this was this was pretty influential for me. Mark Damaratnam helped me get into this group, and he was a member there. And he's one of the top uh, trumpet freelancers in Montreal. Um, and his wife played in the Montreal Symphony. Um, but being part of that group, the whole band was if they were either like a, a classical player or they were a jazz player. And if they were a classical player, I think it was almost all of the classical players that were in that band were subs with the Montreal Symphony. Like it was really high quality players. And then the jazz players that were in that band were like the leading jazz players in Montreal. Um, so again, just made great connections there. But again, it just like learned a ton um, just from listening to other people, just sitting beside them all the time. Um, hearing them play, figuring out style. And I, I actually, when I was at UPEI, I used to play in a funk band as well, a disco funk band called Mystery Snail. I know that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I did, I, I'd forgotten. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think we were together like five years. Um, and, and that was great. And I was like, I, I was a, a decent lead player, um, but I didn't have much improv chops. I, I could you know, blow a little bit, but wasn't my strong suit. But then whenever I joined that band in uh, the military band in Montreal, um, sitting like as a second trumpet player um, or a third trumpet player next to like these lead players in Montreal, like I just learned so much about playing lead trumpet, playing in that style. Um, yeah, so those were really formative experiences for me as well. So, and, but, but basically like I, I worked as a freelancer while, while I was studying and then a year after as well. But then the year after that, actually one of my friends, he was teaching at a, a local high school and he got a job at another school and kind of like at last minute they needed uh, a teacher and he knew I had um, a teaching degree as well. So I went in and taught for that year um, full time as a middle and middle and high school band teacher. And I just did that for one year and then kept playing. And then actually the following year is when I stuck, that's when I kind of consider that I really started my teaching career, which was at Lower Canada College. Um, yeah, which was, uh, let's, let's yeah. Talk that, about that. Let's talk about that. Sure. So, so, so you, you learned all this orchestral, repertoire and you developed your jazz chops and so um and then you start teaching what middle yeah. and high school band yeah middle and high school band grade 7 to 11 because uh um in quebec it, you finish high school in grade 11 and then you move on to sage up right a college program yeah. so yeah at so Lower canada college let's let's talk about that Sure. Yeah. So I was there for five years. Um, and that's kind of like when I first, it, it was kind of like my program. I was working with another teacher, but like it, I wasn't kind of filling in. Right. It, and uh, so I was developing my own program there and I loved it. You know, I was still working a lot as a musician and I loved that as well. But um, yeah, when, when I'm in front of, um, middle school kids and high school kids like that's it's very a very special place so I loved um, developing relationships with my students um, making the music department a place to be uh, a place where kids were getting excited about music and having that kind of um, influence on people in a, in a very positive way it was it, it, it was great it was thrilling um just as much as playing um so yeah at that time we 
yeah, we, we had, we would go to music festivals each year um, and, and that was great. But I also remember doing a lot of creative stuff with, with them. Um, so for me, going through my own high school experience, which I thought was fantastic, it was all about playing. And, and that was great for me and it resonated with me, but it didn't always resonate with everybody else. And so I, I kind of felt like my time at Lower Canada College was experimenting with, okay, how can I hit kids with music in a way that they're going to respond to, take, to attract as many people as possible? And so I, I had some, some kids that were you know, not, not fantastic on their instrument, but fine and happy enough there. But then when we did like a composition thing, like they just had such creative ideas and they were doing amazing things, writing arrangements and like it, it music hit it for them with, with that aspect. And then we developed a recording studio there as well. And um, I remember this year, we kind of spent a year doing like uh, I think it was grade tens and we were doing like three part harmony stuff for a while and then getting into chord changes and then into a songwriting thing. And then eventually the kids had to um, find musicians to play their song so they could find some teachers, they could find other students, whatever. And then uh, we I bring them down to the basement and they had to engineer their own recording. They'd have to multi-track it and, uh, all that stuff. And there were some kids, again, that weren't the greatest songwriters, weren't the greatest clarinet players. But man, when they got like on the computer doing, they did some incredible things that just far outshined somebody else that was a great trombone player. Um, so like for me, that was, I, I just love that challenge of trying to light a spark with as many people as possible and for kind of whatever they need uh, for that individual person. I understand. Good. So um, before we move any further with your teaching career, could you, sure. could you speak to uh, your career as a conductor? There were a variety of sure. ensembles you got, got to work with. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I started conducting with Christy Beck, you know, and I would take those brass kids down to the stage and work with them. And I was doing gestures and uh, conducting and whatnot. Um, but I had an excellent conducting teacher whenever I was at UPEI. Um, really great gestures, um, um, great rehearsal technique. Uh, I don't know if you know him. His name is Dr. Simon. Oh. <laughs> There you go. I don't recall teaching conducting, but I, I remember conducting the band. Okay. Good. Oh, yeah. Good. No, I remember in secondary ed, you had us conducting our um, our class all the time. And yeah, and I remember you going over to uh, to students while, while we were in conducting class. Uh, you probably still do. Or I mean, in secondary ed class. And uh, you would whisper to somebody, he's like, okay, play F sharp here. Um, and uh, you would on purpose, make people make mistakes. Oh yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, just and to, we had to figure it out, right? Yeah, of course, yeah, just uh, test, test the yeah. uh, the oral side of the conducting art. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then with Carl Mathis, we had to conduct the choir. I think for three or four years, we would have our um, turn up there conducting. I had so much conducting experience coming out of UPEI that the idea of gesture was always well it felt relatively natural so yeah then when I when I moved to Montreal you know I was teaching but like working with a lot of other musicians as well I don't even know how it started but it, it actually probably started with Mark Dharmaratnam with the Lakeshore concert band so he had this concert band on the west um, side of Montreal it was a community concert band but they were good like really good players. Um, and I had probably done a little bit of conducting with the military band with, with him in it as well. And so when he was a busy musician, so he would often have to miss. And then he would just call me and I would go in and conduct the band. And it was great. And 
I loved working with them. They were so excited to play. Um, and it, it was just like a very natural, natural thing. Um, but anyway, from that, then um, a lady named Lorraine Petrie, if I'm remembering it correctly, she wanted to start um, another charitable um, concert band. And so she asked me to be the conductor and that was the Mimosa band. We used to do a couple of concerts per year. Um, so that was great. That was kind of my first time conducting like, my own group of adults. And uh, it was great, uh, lots of fun. And then uh, eventually, yeah, Mark Domaratnam started um, the Pops Orchestra in Montreal. And then I was the assistant conductor for that as well. And it was great. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, you know what? To expand on conducting, I think, I think for me, I learned a ton about conducting actually from watching conductors. That's how we do so, it. So, yeah. So, being in the Montreal Symphony and I was just like scared out of my mind the very first time I had to play. I knew of Charles Dutois's reputation, who was like an old school conductor who definitely had a temper. You did not want to get on his bad side. You don't want to play out of tune or make wrong notes. And so I, I remember yeah, just being frightened of that. Um, and yeah, like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, my first gig with them was playing Verdi's Requiem. And there's one of the movements where all four trumpet players on stage, so there's eight trumpet parts in that one, four on stage and four off stage. And I was playing fourth trumpet on stage. And there's one movement where all four trumpet players have to start with and nobody else is playing. It's the beginning of the movement. It's not like you've established tempo from somewhere else and you're just joining in. It's only the trumpets just doing that. And I remember going to my lesson with Paul. And I was like, Paul, man, like I've, I've seen Charles Dutois conduct. Um, he's always way ahead of the beat, always. And if you can even tell that there's a beat. Um, I was like, how am I going to know when to start? And Paul's like... Uh, you'll just know. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And yeah, so then we got to that spot and like the movement before finishes, we get there and very first rehearsal, Charles Dutois does something like, and we all came in at exactly the same time. It must, it, it felt like a minute after he stopped moving. It was probably only a second or so. Right. But um, anyway, it, like from, from that experience and talking with Paul, especially about um, conductors, the, the higher up in level that I played, I stopped watching conductors for time. So like as a young musician, you're, you know, you're, you're taught the, the perfect beats and really good ictus and gesture and all of that. Um, and it's important. And as a young musician, you rely on that. But as an experienced musician, man, you, you, you cannot rely on that. You have to use your ears. Um, and, and so playing with the Montreal Symphony was actually, you know, some of the easiest gigs that I did because everybody played so well in tune, so well in time, that all you had to do was just fit in. Um, if you listened, um, and you obviously you knew your stuff, then you could just fit in there and it was easy. The, the beat's not moving around a whole bunch. Um, you're not trying to find things. Uh, it, it just works. Um, but I remember um, talking to Paul about Charles Dutois and I was like, uh, and so he told me a story about Petrushka. So in Petrushka, there's a trumpet solo that goes da 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 It's like the nemesis of all trumpet players. And it's all by yourself, just with the snare drum. And Paul's like, I never watch Dutois whenever I'm playing that solo, never. Um, he's like, I just stare at the fourth button down on his tuxedo and, uh, and uh, then I just play. Um, and he's like, even there, there was times, uh, cause he played that solo a number of times, he's like, where Dutois would kind of make funny faces at him while he was playing that solo and he just never knew because he was never <laughs> looking uh, directly there. 
But that's not to say that the conductor is not useful. Charles Dutois was an un or is an unbelievable musician, crazy good. And there's he brought that the Montreal Symphony into excellence. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing. It, it, he he didn't have to be like the perfect the small conductor showing every every little thing, but the way he rehearsed and what the gestures that he would show were showing the music, um, not necessarily just time. Um, and so that was that was eye opening for me. And um, yeah, recordings of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra under Charles Dutois. Absolutely exceptional stunning absolutely yeah good totally very good yeah Jonathan, let's let's move on if we sure. could so so you spent all all this time developing your teaching chops your trumpet chops your conducting chops and then you decided to leave canada so could you speak to that please sure <laughs> um well, I grew up in a very small place, um, in a very small world, and I didn't know what was out there. Um, so, I, but the other thing I think I had going for me is I wasn't afraid to ask questions as well. And like I had spoken to earlier, I, if, if I wanted to get better, I would go ask somebody who was better than me and get lessons with them. And I, I was never shy about just whatever opportunities it came up, I, I say yes. And I continue to say yes. So that's opened a lot of doors. And basically what I, I guess what happened was in my, in our fourth year teaching at Lower Canada College, it's like we're, my wife and I were doing well. My, my daughter at the time was in grade four, I think. And uh, we kind of finally had enough money where we could go on our first like real vacation. And we went to the Dominican Republic, went to a club med and all inclusive, right? Okay. And that was great. Um, came back home, taught the rest of the year. And uh, then it was uh, the following school year coming up to Christmas time. And um, I can't remember if this was before Christmas or after Christmas, but it doesn't matter. It was particularly cold and Montreal gets cold, even colder than Charlottetown. Hey. Um, and uh, I remember just thinking to myself, I'm like, there, there must be like schools and other places in the world. I like, I, I wonder what's out there. And uh, I remember going on, on the internet and I was just like, you know, looking up schools and different places. And I was like, oh, we went to Dominican Republic last year. And uh, so I looked it up um, and the school, the biggest school in Dominican Republic is called the Carol Morgan School. And so that popped up and on their front page of their website, which looked like at the time it had been designed in the 1990s, like it was pretty basic, but at the top of the page, it said that they were looking for a band teacher and a choir teacher for the following year. And Jamin was upstairs. Um, I was like, hey, dear, come check this out. And uh, she came down, we looked at it, and she's like, this is ridiculous. But then we kind of talked about it, and you get that idea in your head. And so we we're like, okay, well, let's just like fire off an application. And this was also in the infancy of Skype. Um, but basically, within like a couple of days, um, they had gotten back to us. We did a Skype interview, and basically, from seeing that website to uh, uh, resigning from our jobs and signing contracts was a two week period. Wow. So yeah, we had not planned on this at all, but again, it was like, okay, what, what could we, what, what experience could we get from this? And it just seemed like it could be some neat life experiences. Um, Let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, your work in the Dominican Republic uh, and uh, both as uh, a teacher and mm. your work with playing in the uh, National Symphony Orchestra there. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess I think it was like 2004. No, 2009. Yeah, 2009. I moved down there and uh, it was it was a, I was going into a middle and high school band program. I was the only band teacher. 
And uh, Jamin, my wife, she was uh, going as the choir teacher. And um, yeah, like we, we had gone in there and there was uh, a band teacher who had been there six years prior who everybody talked about. He was a great band teacher and did, had done really cool things. And then they went through um, six years of like a one year and two year contracts where the, the, the those teachers just didn't stay. And uh, the person who came before me, um, he was from Hawaii and he was actually decent. He was starting to build up the band program again. So when I got there, the band program was small, but the kids could play relatively well. And I think we were in high school, probably playing like grade three music, um, which, which was decent for, for high school. Um, but basically we would start. So I think there was about, I want to say like maybe 80 kids per grade. Um, and it was a lot of local Dominicans. They were kind of like the wealthy Dominicans because it was at a private school there. But um, it was called an international school, but there wasn't that many international kids there. It was mostly um, local kids, which had its pros and its cons. I, Jamie and I both, we love the students there, love their families. One of the pros was, is that those kids were staying at the school. They weren't just there for a couple of years and then moving on to a different embassy, a different country. So the kids that we started in grade six, um, we saw them right through to grade 12. Um, and we were their teacher all the way through. And it was a lot of fun because we were, Jamie and I were both working together in the music program, doing shows together and whatnot, but kids stayed in the program, which was really cool. And I guess it was in our sixth year, the school was going through an accreditation and they, uh, they came and actually they did a special accreditation program um, on the music program. Um, and we had to write a big report for it of like everything that we were doing in the music program. But one of the things that we had said was there was 50% of all middle and high school kids were either in band or choir. Um, and so the guy came that was doing the accreditation from the United States and He's like, I read the report and I just assumed it was a typo because like every other school that I go to in the state in the United States where I do accreditations, it's like there might be like four or 5% of the kids that are in the band program. And we had 50%. Um, so it was great. Like we just had like a great family of kids and their parents and whatnot. And they, we had fun playing. Um, we did cool concerts. Um, and yeah, and so that, that was fantastic. We loved it. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah so, but then for me, I, I'm, I've always been a practicer. So whether I had stuff going on or not, I was always a practicer. So like, even when I was in Dominican Republic and the new person on the block there, obviously I, nobody knew who I was and I wasn't playing any gigs, but I still practiced and I went to watch symphony concerts. And eventually I just, I started meeting people and then, you know, from meeting those people, I got my first gig with the National Symphony there where they needed an extra trumpet player. And then I started uh, developing relationships with those people. And then eventually, actually, the uh, principal trumpet player, he, he was a bit of an older guy, not not too old, but he was like he, he had kind of finished playing with them. He was a monster player, but um, he only wanted to come in and do a few gigs a year and not do everything. So the conductor asked me, he's like, Jonathan, like, would you be able to come like be a permanent member of the orchestra? And I was like, yeah, like I, I'll have to check with the school because rehearsals are during the school day. So I had written a letter to our headmaster at the school and I said, you know, they, they've asked me to do this. I, I had a, a teaching assistant at the time as well. I said, um, rehearsals are, you know, 10 o'clock until one o'clock. Um, so it would mean that like, eat, I think two days a week that I would miss one class. Um, and then my assistant could take over. Um, but when I went to the headmaster and I said this, 
um, I said, you know, the benefits of this are like, I'm making connections with the symphony orchestra, with all of those players um, and making connections to be able to collaborate with the orchestra as well. And, and I said, for me as well, I get no better professional development than one going playing with other musicians, but especially going to play for other conductors. Um, it's like, you, you can't teach that stuff. You can teach that stuff, but like that was my professional development. And so when they, when they saw that written out well, and that I had a solution for the classes being taken over and that I was still at the school 90% of the time, like, um, cause the concerts were only every second week, not, not every week. Um, then they were all for that. And that turned into a great relationship between the school and the orchestra. We, I used to take the school band and we would play in the lobby of the orchestra before symphony concerts. And so I would go conduct the band there and then finish 15 minutes before the concert was about to start and then uh, go backstage and then play the concert. Um, yeah, so that was great. But I, it, that that orchestra kind of kicked my butt a little bit as well because they play lots of we played lots of classical music but we also played a lot of latin music in that orchestra and latin music is not like jazz music uh the style is very different and i remember trying to play some of those rhythms with every with all of these latin players i was always behind the beat because they just play so on top of the beat uh, that i was not accustomed to but it was great because in that orchestra, I was the co-principal trumpet and the other trumpet player was uh, a guy named Ernesto Nunez. And he is the trumpet player with Juan Luis Guerra, who is one of the largest Latin stars, uh, huge Grammy award winning guy. So like this guy can play. So basically when we were playing Tchaikovsky, I would play principal and then we were playing merengues, uh, then he would. And then again, just sitting beside these players is just such an education, learning style from them and learning rhythm. And yeah, I fell in love with Latin music there. It was fantastic. Okay. So, so while you're in the Dominican Republic, you create this wonderful, inclusive culture at the international school there and, and 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 you're playing in the national symphony orchestra and then malaysia enters the picture so could you speak to that sure well this is a little bit of a funny story <laughs> so um our daughter graduated from uh in the dominican republic and we stayed on two years past that but basically when she was uh, getting ready to go into, when, when she was in 10th grade and getting ready to go into 11th, we had heard about the IB program. And I hadn't really heard about it before that. And it, uh, our daughter is, she's a high flyer academically and that's that's her thing. And um, so we, we were thinking like, okay, well, we've had this cool, really amazing international experience now. Like maybe we should kind of look and see what else is out there. So there's an, a, this group called uh, Search Associates, which is uh, basically where the vast majority of international teaching jobs are posted. Um, and if there are UPEI students uh, looking at this right now, check out Search Associates, it's worth your while. Um, but it's it, at the time, and it still is, it's, it's a, a website, if you sign up for it, um, they'll show you every, almost every job internationally, It'll say what the cost of living is. It'll tell you what the salary, the expected salary is, the benefits, all of those things. So we, we kind of signed up for that just to kind of see what was out there. And as we were researching places that looked cool in the world to go and, you know, that would be, uh, that would have like an IB program for our daughter and um, like a good quality school, basically ISKL came to the top of the list. And so we kind of looked into it, but at the time when she was in 10th grade, there was no openings there for music, but we remembered that kind of just being at the top of the list. So there was, you know, a couple of other things, but not really anything for band and a choir teacher, right? And uh, yeah, so, but we, we were super happy in the Dominican Republic, like we weren't wanting to leave, but just kind of seeing what was out there. 
And so we just kind of left our stuff up on search associates, but we kind of like set our account so that we weren't looking for jobs anymore, but our stuff was still there. Hmm. Anyway, so we're happy playing lots, good bands, uh, doing lots of fun things. And then our daughter graduates. Um, she heads off to the United States to go to school. And then we're in, my wife and I are both in Dominican for two more years, but then in that second year after she left, I get an email in the month of October and it's ISKL. They reached out to me and they just said, hey, I, I, I found your resume on um, Search Associates, even though our account was deactivated and just wondered if you might be interested in doing an interview. So I told Jamin and um, so we both did the interview and it was, um, it was only for a band position. Um, anyway, so we're doing the interview, it's with the high school principal and, uh, basically he, he, um, he's a Canadian guy from Ontario. Uh, and I was like, we had a really nice interview. And, but at the end of it, I just said, listen, like our daughter's in an Ivy league school right now, which costs a fortune. And if there's only one job, there's just no way that we we can afford to do that, you know, like, and I told him that we looked at ISKL four years ago, super flattering. Um, and, but then at the end of the interview, I asked him, I was like, you know, how did you, how did you find my name? Like, he's like, oh, well, we, we make a, a point to go through the resumes and like really seek out um, the people we're looking for. I was like, oh, okay. He's like, funny enough, when I was looking at your resume, it said that you studied at McGill and with Paul Markello. I was like, oh yeah, I said, you know who Paul Markello is? And he's like, yeah, yeah, he's the principal trumpet of the Montreal Symphony. <laughs> and uh, he's like, funny enough, my wife is from Montreal. I was like, oh, okay. And she used to date him. Small yep, small world. So he saw that and made that connection. He's like, okay, I'll reach out to this guy. Anyway, we turned down the job, right? So. That's fine. He emails me a couple of weeks later. He's like, you know, I really wish this could have worked, but, you know, we had to, to hire somebody. So they filled the high school position. Um, and that was fine. We were, again, we were super happy in the Dominican Republic. But then, um, then we signed our contracts and uh, at the end of November. And uh, then the Wednesday before Christmas break was about to start. We get another email in the morning from ISKL and they said, I guess timing is everything. Now we have a high school choir position open and a middle school band position open. I was like, oh my gosh. And went in and I uh, told Jamin she was recording practice tracks at the time. And uh, she said, uh, just leave me alone. Like, we, we already signed our contracts, you know. But I went to, my supervisor was the middle school principal and I just said to him, um, you know, this happened, what do, what do you think? He's like, well, high scale is a really big school. It's like a, a tier one school, you know, and band and choir doesn't come up every day. So why don't I just talk to the headmaster, see what she says? I'm like, okay, great. So we had a, um, a meeting, he set up a meeting with our current headmaster at, in Dominican Republic that afternoon. She's said exactly the same thing. She's like, we're really early in our hiring um, right now. She's like, I can give you until Friday. And this was Wednesday. Um, it's like, okay. So we emailed ISKL. They interviewed us that night. They interviewed us again that morning. And then by Thursday night, they had offered us the job. Yeah. And so again, that's just, you know, an opportunity came up and we said yes. And that was fantastic. This is a great place to be. Very good. So could you speak to the sort of work you're doing in Malaysia. Sure. Yeah, well, um, so my work in Malaysia kind of mimics um, what I've been doing in other places. I, I, I moved here and I taught middle school band, uh, grade six to grade eight. And I love it. It's fantastic. Like turning kids onto music, there's, there's no better thing in the world. Um, and trying to teach to every single kid and figure out what makes them tick and what's going to um, resonate with them is amazing. I love it. Um, 
But then also just uh, uh, just like the other places, I came here not not playing uh, or not knowing anybody and not having anybody to play with. But then as um, as the first year went on, it kind of started to get a few gigs. But funny enough, um, when I was in Dominican Republic, even though Latin music is like the number one music there, I was the classical player there. And then when I moved to KL, there's a decent number of classical musicians here, but not very many jazz musicians. And actually the vast majority of the gigs now that I've um, been doing over the last number of years, uh, pre-COVID, um, have been playing with a salsa band, playing uh, some jazz gigs, a number of jazz festivals, playing uh, lead trumpet and big band. And uh, so that's been super fun for me and, and just like a new challenge as well. I've been trying to work on my improv chops as well. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's been a ton of fun. Terrific. Terrific. Hmm. So, so, so Jonathan, as, as you reflect on the scope and breadth of your career to date, how did your UPEI undergraduate degree prepare you for all that has happened since? Yeah, well, it's crazy thinking back almost 30 years to starting at UPEI. Um, but I, I think I said this earlier is the fact that you had to do everything at UPEI um, and especially that you had to develop your musicianship. Um, I think that is just, that, that was the best gift. And my wife would say the same thing that we, we could have received. Um, it, it basically gave me the chops to, to be a player in the professional world. Um, it gave me the opportunity to be a soloist with the wind symphony, with the orchestra, to play in the orchestra, to play uh, in a brass quintet, to get out and teach in, in schools, like a, in, with our conducting classes. Um, there was just so many opportunities to do everything that was involved with music. Um, and not the same type of competition that you get in those bigger places. And I think that is just so valuable, mm -hmm. just having that opportunity. Like if you're the best of the best at, um, at McGill or um, Juilliard, then you're going to get tons of opportunities. But maybe the other people that are just a little lower aren't going to get those opportunities. And I, I remember that at McGill as well, like the undergrad music ed people stopped playing their instruments after second year. They weren't in any of the ensembles and whatnot. And yeah, UPEI doesn't let that happen or it didn't in our time anyway. And that was just such a gift. Yeah, Terrific. such a so, gift. So Jonathan, as we wrap up, what sure. message would you have for our current students? Well, I would say if you really wanna be a teacher, dig into your music chops, make sure that you're a great musician, make sure that you, your students catch you practicing and, be, and, and show them that you're involved in music and that you care about it. And if you wanna be a performer, man, network, <laughs> meet people, call people, go to see people, hang out with people. Um, it is just so, so important to, to yeah, develop those relationships be able to tell a funny story, be able to hang out with people, be somebody that people want to be around. Uh, it's just so important if you want to work in the freelance world. Um, most of it is not audition. So it's like if somebody knows you, they're going to call you. Um, if somebody wants to play with you, if they want to be around you, then they're going to call you. So working on those people skills. And then, I don't know, for, for this is maybe just me, but if you're able to do both, um, take it, man. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's a door. quite a ride. Indeed. Yep. So, uh, Jonathan, that's, that's a terrific message. Develop your musicianship and, and network. Terrific. So, so Jonathan, thank you for sharing with us this remarkable career of yours. It's really 
um, truly remarkable all you've been able to accomplish and experience since your undergraduate degree at UPEI. So on behalf of the UPEI music community, please accept our best wishes for your continuing professional success and personal happiness. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Thanks for doing these.